Good afternoon and welcome to Boy for Lunch. My name is Jeanette Marks. I'm the managing librarian up at the King County Branch Library. And I want to welcome you. And just to remind you, next Friday is our last fall session of Book for Lunch. We will have the author John E. Cuthbertson to talk about his book, The Mighty Rifle River, The Headwaters of Aranac County and Surrounding Areas of Northern Michigan. Memories of Lumbering Camps, Woodlands, Personalities, and River Drives. I hope you all can make it. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Tara Welsh is the Executive Director of Studio 23, the Arts Center, and an avid reader. She will be reviewing the book, The Monuments Men, by Robert M. Etzel. And now, here's Tara. Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. It's nice to see so many people. I'm here to hear about the Monuments Men. So I was very excited to be asked to review a book for the Book for Lunch program. Um, I have been to a few Book for Lunch programs and have always enjoyed them. So it was a really fun idea to think, oh, I can do my own book now. So the information that I will be sharing with you today um, are my personal opinions on the book, my personal opinions on the history and other research that I've done. Um, I think with history, you always meet somebody that knows more than you do, and so I'm very okay with saying that. So throughout my presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free just to raise your hand and stop me. Um, presentations are a lot of fun when they turn into more of a conversation. So before we start, um, I would just like to share a little bit more information about myself and about the organization that I represent. So some fun facts about me. Um, I live in Bay City with my husband Brent and our dog Sadie. Um, Sadie is a Springer Spaniel and we love talking about her. She has a very great personality and does absolutely everything with us. She kayaks, paddle boards, um, hikes, goes on the boat, goes camping, so she's really great. Um, we really enjoy the outdoors. I graduated from Saginaw Valley State University in 2014 with a degree in history and a degree in art. And that is why I work at Studio 23. Um, and I've always been an avid reader ever since I was very young. Um, I've always enjoyed all types of genres. Um, I read pretty much anything. And then about Studio 23, Studio 23, the Art Center, um, we have been an organization since 1959. We have been in five different homes and we've even been homeless at certain amounts of time. Um, 24 founding members started Studio 23 with the simple vision that they wanted a place to exhibit artwork. So what better way to do that than to start at a furniture store? So our first location was at Wyland Furniture. And then we hopped around a few places. Um, the most popular place that everybody knows about is the Little Red Schoolhouse all the way down Center Avenue. We were there for quite a while. And we also were in City Hall. And then now we have our home in the old Jenison Hardware Building on Water Street. Yes? Where did the 23 come from? We, it was on Road US 23, oh. the first location. So um, there were rumors at a time that there were 23 founding members, but going through our paperwork, um, we realized that there were 24. <laughs> so that happens. Um, so we've been in the Jenison Hardware Building since 1998. Uh, we were asked by the Rowleys if we would like a permanent home. So our current president at the time, Charlie Schwartz, met with Peg and Paul Rowley and put down a deposit of $10 to secure a space. So with $10, we have grown into a much larger organization where we now offer educational programming for kids um, starting at infants. And we have, um, you can be as old as you want taking classes at Studio 23. We have painting, mixed media, ceramics, um, photography, all sorts of stuff. And then we also have exhibits and our exhibits 
are to make art accessible to all in our region. So we have two annual exhibits a year. Teen Works and Kids Creations is our K through 12 Bay County art students. And then we have Painters and Potters, which features our students and instructors that take classes. So I'd highly encourage you to come to one of those two exhibits. But um, at your seat, you have a pamphlet for our first citywide art walk. It's in um, partnership with the exhibit that's currently in the studio. It's 50 artists. We had a juried exhibit where we allowed 50 artists from the Great Lakes Bay region to submit pieces for this show. And they have one piece in the studio and they have one piece in a local business. And that is up until the end of November. And it's a really fun way to explore new businesses, to see the art that's in our region. And you also get to help vote for your favorite. And when you vote for your favorite, you help one of those artists win a cash prize of $500. So I would highly encourage you to come see that. And I should say, with my presentations, I try to be really good and I type it all out and I get it all organized and then I always go out on tangent, tangents. So I might get a little lost sometimes, but it'll be fun. So let's talk about the monuments. This was known as the greatest treasure hunt in our history. The book was written by Robert Edsel, and I was lucky enough to hear him speak at SVSU about six years ago. Um, he spoke about the book, The Monuments Men, and his exciting journey to meet some of these men while he was researching his vision. Um, this came about from a trip to Florence that he took, and it just piqued his interest and the history of the art preservation during this war, and that's how he got started. This is not the only book he's written. Um, he has written a couple other books now. I haven't read his other books, but I'm sure that they're very good. And I actually have my signed copy from him, which I always think is pretty interesting. So I didn't write in this book, I didn't highlight in this book. You never know, it might be worth something someday, right? So. <laughs> Um, just a brief overview of, so how I'm going to go through this speech, I guess I'll explain that. I'm going to go through the sections of the book that it was broken down into, and then I'm going to talk about a couple of the art pieces at the end that they saved. And I also have a, just a couple short video clips of um, speeches, um, one speech from one of the main characters, which I think is very interesting that we are able to hear from some of these monuments monuments men that are still alive today that usually sometimes that doesn't happen with history so we should be very grateful that we actually get to hear it from them so the men were responsible for saving the masterpieces of our heritage and culture sculptures painting churches and many more items were saved by these men there were nine men on the ground in northern europe and this is um, one of the first wars that um, we had our president at the time place an importance on the culture. Usually during wars, we see it happen all the time that the enemy comes in and just demolishes everything. There's no, there's no reasoning to save any of the artifacts. There's no reasoning to save the buildings. And so it was very important that they wanted to, to do this. And Hitler's goal at this time was to erase all the history so he could rebuild it up as his own. So many of these artifacts would have been destroyed. And uh, something to think about too is that the men didn't just save the artwork from um, Italy, um, not just the artwork from Europe and France, they saved the German culture as well. And history books often look over their significance in this war. I know when I learned about World War II when I was a child, I did not learn about the Monuments Men. We did not learn about the artwork. So it is important that we do learn about this. And so the Monuments Men, they were very interesting because they're not your traditional soldiers. They were the average age of 40, as we learned in the book. And in World War II, the average age of the American soldier was only 26, which is actually, I, I was surprised by that. I thought it was going to be a little younger. I thought it was going to be more towards the age of 20 or 21. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. Um, and these men were chosen because of their careers. They were chosen because of their knowledge. They were not just drafted in. They were hand-selected to do this. 
So our book is laid out into five sections. We start with the mission, we move into Northern Europe, we move into Germany, and then it breaks it down at the end for the void and the aftermath. So just to see, how many people actually read the book? So how many people saw the movie? A lot more hands. Okay, so fun fact, I did not see the movie, so I've only read the book and listened to many reviews on the book so I will do my best. Um, after this, I told myself that I really have to watch that movie. So if you didn't read the book, the book is actually very well written for someone that's not a historian. It, it's very vivid with his imagery, and you really get to see the faces of these men that were there, and the women, and the locations. So if you have ever read a history book, like I have, some of the books get pretty dull, and this book did not do that for me. Um, he mixes it up with some pictures, which are always great to look at, the historical pictures of what was happening, and then he also mixes it up with um, letters. And I always enjoy reading letters and some of the um, communication going back and forth. It was a really nice way to break up some of the chapters. And then in the back of the book, um, you're not really going to be able to see it, but in the back of the book, he has a map of each of the monuments men and how they took their routes through Europe and into Germany. So I thought that was really interesting as well because as we learned, George Stout, one of the men, was very good about tracking where everybody was going and what things they were saving. So to start us off, I'm going to show a quick video from CBS News. Um, it just kind of gives us a nice little intro about them. Century painting was returned to Poland today, nearly 70 years after it was stolen by the Nazis. The campaign to recover looted artwork dates back to 1943, when FDR ordered the biggest treasure hunt in history. It's the subject of a new movie, and we asked Mark Strassman to tell us the story of the real monuments men. Time to put a team together and do our best to protect buildings, bridges, and art before the Nazis destroy everything. The movie The Monuments Men tells the story of the Nazis looting of five million works of art and a battle to save them. Their plunder included masterpieces. The Allies sent a group of 345 museum curators, historians, and architects to rescue the stolen art. They found themselves uh, unintentionally as treasure hunters trying to track down millions of cultural objects that have been stolen by the Nazis. Robert Edsel wrote the book that became the movie. Are we really old for that? Yes. These are middle-aged people. They have every reason in the world to not volunteer for military service. But they felt they had a contribution to make as part of winning the war, winning the freedom, by preserving the great cultural treasures of Europe. Harry Ettinger, now 88, is one of three surviving monuments men. Did you open up some of the boxes? Yes. And what did you see? I brought paintings, sculptures, books. He was 19 years old, fluent in German, and could read Nazi inventory codes. You're a German Jew forced to leave Germany, Jesus. who goes back to Germany, to help with the war effort. I went back into the American soldier, not into the Jewry. Instead of taking things, we adopted a policy of returning them to rightful owner. It gave us a good feeling that we were able to come along and do that. So last week, Sotheby's auctioned four paintings recovered by the monuments men. You can see on the back. You can still see where the Nazis numbered the stolen painting. There it is. Park Monceau. Robert Edsel took us to the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, home to a dozen paintings recovered by the monuments men. But the whereabouts of other major works remains a mystery, including this portrait by Raphael. I think there are hundreds of thousands of works of art, cultural objects, library books, documents that are missing. We're still gathering the pieces. We're still solving the mysteries. Just last year, German authorities announced they had found 1,400 pieces in this Munich apartment, including works by Matisse and Picasso. 
Nearly 70 years after the war, the treasure hunt continues. Mark Strassman, CBS News, New York. An 18th century painting was returned. of Harry with um, some of the actors in the movie that you will recognize. I think that's a pretty great picture that they actually got to learn from him while he was preparing, why they were preparing for those roles. So um, again, the book is laid out in five sections, so we are going to start with the mission. The book begins with the history of the Jews in Germany, focusing on the Etlinger family. And this is where we are introduced to Private Harry Etlinger, one of the main characters in our story. And we learn that he is a Jew, and he is living in Germany at the time, and they have to migrate over to America. And I think it's really powerful how he stated in the CBS brief interview that he went back to Germany as an American soldier. Um, he really took pride in America, and he was very passionate about trying to fix what was going on. And um, later in the story, we're going to learn more about his grandfather's art collection that he was lucky enough to help bring back to New Jersey that was stolen um, from the Nazis. So we see that Hitler is determined to create his own art city in Linz. He's inspired by Florence, the art capital of Italy, and he has his army systematically stealing the artwork to create this museum. The men were very smart and very precise because they cataloged everything that they were taking. They knew the artist, they knew the title of the piece, they knew where it was hiding, and they knew where they were going to ship it to. So they were, they were very prepared. And Hitler wanted to be an artist when he was a young boy. He actually attempted to get into the Vienna Academy of Art twice. In 1907 and 1908, he was denied and he believed that the panel was made up of Jews. And so this is said to have shaped his um, anger for the Jews, and it really helped us learn how he felt about our work. So his goal was to purge and rebuild. He wanted to make an empire out of Germany, much like the Romans. And he had labeled Linz, Austria as his art city. The museum he wanted to create um, was called the Fur Museum, meaning the Leader's Museum, and this would be his artistic legacy. So at the time during World War II, American museums were gathering to discuss their own plans on what to do in the war. They wanted to remain open for the public, but they also at the same time wanted to take precautions with certain pieces, and they took them to safety in case of a bombing. And here we're introduced to Lieutenant George Stout, our second main character in the story. And we learn about his patience, appearance, and far-reaching vision. And he is the one, I believe, that's played by George Clooney in the movie. Um, so he's an expert in the preservation of art, and he probably became such a perfectionist, um, or he became known for his preservation in art because he's a perfectionist and because he took his time. Um, oil painting takes a very long time to dry. Oils usually take, can take a couple weeks to dry, depending on how thick you put it on. And so just to learn how to rebuild some of these paintings is, is very incredible. And so the organization begins, and he is very concerned about the lack of the organization from officials for their unit. And he knew that the men were very well qualified, but they weren't given any backup or arms to defend themselves. So now we see that the Monuments men were um, assigned into sections overseas, and they weren't really given any firm orders, and we can see that there's a lot of um, miscommunication, and some people go over there, and they're there for a few months before even knowing where to go and what to do. And so we see there's no radios, um, they have no cars, but we figure out later in the story how they kind of work around that. And then we move into Northern Europe. So they are, they're now um, trying to warn the military 
that certain sites are sacred. So as our military is taking over these areas, they really want them to pay attention to what they're going into. What kind of buildings are you going into? You know, to take more caution so we're not just going in and ruining everything. So Stout finally finds a car. He finds an abandoned Volkswagen and he jumps it and makes it his own. And we can see that he's a natural born leader that a lot of these characters are going to look up to. Then we have another main character, Roarmor, who found a site that was overrun by soldiers. And this is a really interesting story because he's trying to notify them that they need to be more careful. These soldiers were partying and he is actually arrested by the American soldiers because they think he's a German spy. So they're going to take him to the main camp and then that's where they learn that he is actually an American soldier. And so this is where we really see that so a lot of the soldiers didn't know that the monuments men were even there. They didn't know what they were trying to do. They weren't aware that they were trying to save the art. So um, another main character, Balford, um, he is one of the ones that really wants to find the Madonna piece. So he is, throughout the story, he's always a couple steps behind trying to pick up the pace and trying to get the Madonna before it is taken all the way into Germany. So he makes postcards and he begins passing them out to people, just trying to get them to recognize the piece. So if they see the piece or they've heard about where the piece has gone, that he can track it and get there. And then a couple other characters, Hancock and Stout, start discovering the German respiratories and they find one that was untouched by Hitler's army. So in, the late, in late 1944, they finally receive some backup. They get three men um, to work as assistants to help them. And in this section, uh, we learn a little bit more about the Louvre and the director of the Louvre um, took precautions ahead of time to save his art which is very smart and very good. So when Germans came in and they were trying to take the art away, the director would drown them in paperwork. He just made it nearly impossible. And I've had to sign lots of forms before too and know that sometimes that is just really annoying. So by doing that, he was able to save a lot of the pieces in the Louvre so the Nazis wouldn't take them. And then one of the characters that I really thought was interesting is Rose. So we're introduced to her, and she is one who spied on the Nazis. She was so smart that she tracked their shipments. She documented what pieces they were stealing. She documented where they were taking them, and she would really keep track of this stuff. So she did this, she did this for over four years, and at night she would return to the museum to copy and um, copy anything she possibly could, copy paperwork from the Nazis, she would um, transcribe it from German to um, French or English, and I, about any conversations that she overheard. She was very precise. So she was actually able to save some of the shipments, but not all of them, which was great. And so they continue to find these respiratories with art, and there is actually about a thousand locations that they discovered but the nazis were still taking some of the art out of these respiratories so what they would do is they so the location they would have a whole bunch of art all very categorized let's say there's huge shelvings on these walls and every, they would know where everything is and the really important pieces that they felt would be taken away from them they would actually start moving those further and further into germany to be a step ahead of the Allied forces. So in 1945, George Stout became the um, head leader of the group, and he would travel to his where his men were, were for the most important pieces. And he really kept a detailed map of where they're moving and their progress. And unfortunately, this is also the section where our first monuments men was killed in action. Balfour was killed in an explosion still looking for the Madonna piece. And what is terrible is that his team didn't find out until 12 days later that he passed away. And although the Monuments Men didn't necessarily work very close together because they were so spread out, because they had so much territory to cover, 
And a lot of these men were really upset, you know, that they lost one of their own, like they should be. And so 12 days later is pretty interesting, especially with today's world. You know, we find everything out less than a minute after it happens. So another one of our characters, Warmir, and I apologize if I'm not saying their last names correctly, but he was leaving for Paris for the front. And before Rose finally supplied him with everything he would need to find some of this artwork, she gave him receipts, she gave him pictures of the men who stole the art, and she even gave him more locations of respiratories in southern Germany. And this is also the same time that Hitler ordered his troops to destroy, destroy everything before the Allied forces um, reached them. And what he meant by this is he wanted to make sure that there was no resources for any other armies to take advantage of. So they were to burn everything in a home. They were meant to burn the home down. They were meant to um, explode the bridges so that they couldn't get across pass, pass, passways. Um, anything, weapons, food, and then even to destroy the artwork that was inside of some of these respiratories. At this time, the men stumbled upon a dentist. Um, one of our characters had a terrible toothache, and if you've ever had a toothache, it's not something that you can keep moving with. So they stumbled upon a dentist, and they heard that he might have information about where some of the artwork was. So they wanted to talk to him, they wanted to learn from him, and the man even marked some of the locations of where the artwork was hiding, and even some names of dealers that were trading work. So this is also where we learn and we're learning about how a lot of Hitler's men, his, his first in command, second in command, and all of his high ranking officials were actually trading artwork amongst themselves. So they were still stealing the artwork, but then they were trading it. Whose was whose? Whose was going to the museum? Whose got to go to their own personal collection? So this dentist gives the location of the Ghent altarpiece, which is one of the major pieces that they talk about in the book. And he promised that he would help them find it if they could give him safe passage. But little did they know this Dr. Bungus is one of the corrupt officials that was responsible for much of the French looting of artwork. Um, so Hutch and his assistant were heading to the front to investigate um, the altarpiece, and they get lost and they stumble into active combat and were killed. Or, I'm sorry, just Hutch was killed. And so we keep moving throughout the story and we see that they're finding more respiratories and then when Stout, George Stout comes, he starts to categorize all the pieces. He is assigned with the task of taking everything out of the respiratories and sending them to France. And so they do this very quickly or as quickly as they can and they also stay very organized with all their pieces because they are going to have the job soon of making sure everything is sent back to the rightful owner. In Altissi, Germany, um, the local governor of the city sends crates of explosives to the mine where the Ghent altarpiece and the Madonna were being stored. So now the men finally know where the Ghent altarpiece is and the Madonna are. So as the Allies are advancing closer, <coughs> Hitler was still insisting on his scorched policy, still insisting that his men ruin everything. And so there's an art restorer that's hired to fix the altarpiece, and that's actually one of the pieces I'm gonna talk a little more in depth about um, later. Um, and so he was able to move these pieces to a safer section in the salt mine. And so the salt mine was still intact because at this point, the explosive have, the explosive have not gone off. And after two weeks, the, governor, the government was able to find a solution to the crates full of explosives. And then Hitler has the last birthday that he will celebrate. So the director of the mine ordered the removal of eight crates of explosives. Explosives. And Warmir is still making his way closer to the mine. They're still not quite there yet. And we see here that Hitler commits suicide. Um, he had a breakdown and he couldn't handle losing another army and having another failure so he took his own life 
And then he also had um, one of his commands, Bear and his wife, kill themselves as well before the army was able to capture them and interview them. So we lose kind of three main people that could help tell us, if they would, where a lot of this art was. So the most surprising piece that was found in some of in, in these mines um, were four caskets that the men stole. Um, these four caskets were of some of Germany's most famous men. Um, I didn't quite write down their names, but I thought that was very interesting. So in Hitler's will, he asked that all of the artwork that he looted would be taken to his museum. So he still felt that the German forces would still build his museum and he wanted all of his stuff to go into the museum and be displayed. Well, a lot of his men didn't get this memo, and they, after he died, they still continued to scorch everything and to burn the artwork. And so now the army surrenders, and now they're starting to make arrests for the war and for the looting, and they are finding all these items in the repositories and as they find them they are seeing the detailed cards that are find, found with them and they're seeing how carefully they kept track of all their artwork. And so now the mine at Altasi has been blown and that, that this section kind of leaves you with a little cliffhanger because you're a little worried because all of a sudden we know that the mine is blown and in that mine is the Gantt Alta Police and the Madonna. So the truth about the mine was very difficult to find out because of the communication, and sadly the story was overshadowed by many other happenings at this time during the war. And we learned that the director and the mining staff are the real heroes. They are the ones that saved it. So what they did is they removed the bombs, and then they supervised the explosives of the tunnels. So what they did is they took everything out of the tunnels, they put it, I guess, in the main part, and then they blew up the tunnels with all the artwork safe inside. So it created like a closure. And so they finally know that the Ghent altar piece and the Bruges Madonna were among many of the pieces. And they started digging through the tunnels and making way. And if you um, Google some of the pictures, and I, I believe even some of the pictures in the book, you can see some of the men sitting on top of the dirt with just the small opening in the tunnel. So Stout began recording the pieces that were found inside the mine, and they knew they had to empty the, it very quickly. And so these items were taken to Munich. The <coughs> monuments men continued working after the war, and they had to research the, every single piece to find the rightful owner. And I believe, if, I mean, this might not be correct, but I believe about 97% of the pieces were able to find the rightful owners. Only about 3% were still in discussion. And this is the part where Etlinger was able to retrieve his grandfather's art collection and send it back to New Jersey. And I think that Etlinger's story is so fascinating because he grew up not able to see some of these pieces in museums because he was a Jew. And then he was able to save the pieces that his grandfather collected and send them back home to New Jersey. So the original monuments men went home by the summer of 1946. They all went back to work and they didn't look for any recognition of what they did. And then it wasn't until um, Robert Etzel actually started researching the book that there finally became some more public knowledge of these men. In, in 2007, they were awarded the National Humanities Medal for their service, and the surviving members were able to attend. And so now I have a short clip of Harry Etzler's, Etlinger's, I'm sorry, um, acceptance speech, because I found that really fascinating that we get to hear from him when he's receiving this. With my Four are with us today. <coughs> One monuments man speaks on their behalf, Sergeant Harry Etlinger, and I should point out this is Harry, one of the salt mines. 
discovered in returning a great portrait by Rembrandt, Harry Ebner. Starting 64 years ago during World War II, this country adopted a policy to preserve the cultural entities of Europe. This was contrary to the policy of the leaders of our enemy who were openly bent not only to prioritize the murders of millions but also to destroy the culture of all they deemed to be inferior, which they preached to be virtually all of the human beings. Thus, a relatively tiny international group of men and women embarked on implementing this policy by the leaders of our country. What this small group discovered was the greatest plunder ever perpetrated in the history of civilization. Today, only 12 Americans, I must say, one British, now referred to as the monuments men are still alive. Four and Robert Edsel, our champion, are here today. I, the baby of these soldiers, on behalf of the monuments men, alive and those who have gone to the great young graciously accept the great honor the members of the House and the Senate of these United States of America has bestowed upon us within the last two weeks. God bless you. God bless America. year was that? Um, 2007. Okay. <coughs> and so there's Harry accepting um, one of the medals. I think it's pretty inspiring to hear him speak and especially since he was the youngest one. He was only 19 and where we learned that most of the men, the average age was 40, so he was quite a bit younger. But still, very, the stuff that this man has seen is just astonishing, and how he still feels about his country is very, very noble. So I would like to start talking a little bit more about um, two of the art pieces. I'm going to talk about the adortion of the mystic lamb, more commonly known as the Ghent altarpiece. And this is one of Belgium's most important and artistic treasures. So this being stolen was, was just awful. So if we look at this piece, it measures 12 feet high and 16 feet wide. And it opens on two rows of hinged panels. So this is actually the view of the inside of the piece. And this is the view when it's closed. The artist that commissioned this piece was Hubert van Eyck, and it was painted by his brother, Jan van Eyck. It was completed in 1432. And Jan van Eyck is a very important painter in art history, and he's known as the father of Netherlandish paintings. No painter from his generation left such a distinct and lasting impression on his contemporaries. And for most of his documented life, he was actually a court painter of Philip the Good, who was the Duke of Burgundy. 
When this piece was uh, released, it really shocked the, the Dutch world because of his realistic renditions of his pieces, of his people. So he really stepped away from those flattening images, much like we see in Egyptian art, and um, he took away from the ideal forms that we see in the Romans. So these people weren't meant to look like very masculine people or very flat. They're very realistic, and as we look at some of the pieces, we have Adam here on your left, and we have Eve all the way on your right, and you can see that their arms and their muscles are much more realistic. And actually, this is his only piece that was commissioned for public viewing. Um, I think I could be wrong on this, but much of the court painters painted privately for people, so if someone wanted a portrait, it would sit in that person's room. Yes? Um, court, like, so, like the college court, not like um, the law court. What, yeah, so like the Duke and all of his ladies and men, so he painted inside like a castle for all those people. For the, okay. I, somehow I was thinking like court, police court, law court. Yeah, no, no, not that kind of court. And so we, we can see that this piece was meant for the front of a worship center, and that is why he painted it. So it's representing the Flemish people from the 15th century. And if we look at the landscape, the jewelry, the clothing, he's very realistic in these representations. And we see with this time period in art that there's a lot of symbolism included in the paintings. For example, not in this piece, but in another piece, if a light is shining through a crystal glass, that could evoke the mystery of the Virgin Mary. So they hide all this symbolism in here. So if we look, I have a couple zoomed in um, images of it. So if we look at the piece on our left, we see the lamb is flanked by 14 angels and they're all holding different symbols of the Christ passion. The lamb is also cut right on his heart and so there's blood flowing out of him meant to represent the blood of Christ and the lamb is not in any pain and so that is meant to reference Christ's sacrifice. And we also have if you can zoom in somehow on the main character in the center, um, we can see um, the thrones that they are sitting on featuring pelicans and vine, also reference, referencing the blood spill during the crucifixion of Jesus. And pelicans at that time were believed to spill their own blood to feed their young. Um, so. That's how they were symbolized in there, and then the vines allude to the, the wine, the symbol of Christ's blood. So that upper center panel, in the center, is Christ the King. On the left is the Virgin Mary, and on the right is John the Baptist. And we can see in the panels, they are being flanked by music. So these people on the right that I zoomed in on, um, they are singing for them. And then we have the four on the outside panels. I knew I was going to be switching back and forth. Sorry about that. Um, but we see here another angel. And the donors above in the center, those are the donors, the donor portraits. I have a hard time pronouncing their names, but Jos the Det and his wife, Elizabeth Borlut. And the center panel on the inside shows the Lamb of God, like I, like I discussed, and that there are several groupings above. We see how the sun is shining, and that is meant to say that God is shining down on these people that are worshiping. And so the technique that John Van Eyck uses is very new as well because he's using a lot of layering techniques. He is painting with oil, but he's using very transparent glazes to create this sense of light. 
And so one of the things that he is known for is his um, shadowing. So if we look at some of these figures, we can see that the light is very bright on their foreheads and then how it rounds their faces. And so these are techniques that he is helping develop and helping create to make our figures feel more realistic in some of these paintings. And what's interesting about the Ghent altarpiece is that the Germans were not the first to steal it. These panels have been taken apart separately. They've been sold separately. They've been returned many times, so they all can be together. And so this is a constant thing in history. So in the early 1800s, um, they were bought by an English collector. And then they were bought by the King of Prussia in 1821. And at this time, they're still kept in Germany. And then during World War I, these panels were taken to, from the cathedral in Germany as part, um, sorry, I messed up my news. So they were taken in World War I. Germany took them and kept them for themselves. And then with the Treaty of Versailles, um, they, were, they were required to return the piece back to the church. So this is actually one of the things that Hitler really held as like an anger in his heart because he felt that the Ghent altarpiece was theirs to take. He wanted to take it back because of that Treaty of Versailles. So they, the Germany was required after World War I to return them, and then in World War II they took them back again, but now it is in its rightful home in the church. So when Hitler took it in 1942, um, they, it was stored in a Bavarian castle, and then after the Allied air raids made the castle too dangerous, that's when he transferred it to the salt mine, as was discussed in the monument. Men. And he knew it would be very difficult to steal this piece because we can see it's very large. Right? This is a pretty big piece that you're not really going to fit it in the back of your truck and take it. So um, he felt that he was still entitled to it and he knew it would be difficult and he was going to do it anyways. And he thought this piece was actually German Germanic enough in style that it was um, still a German piece. Um, And actually, still today, so if we see the picture on the left, there is one panel that still has not been discovered, the original panel. This panel was redone by an art restorer, so the piece could still be displayed fully. So we still don't know where that piece is. Um, I mean, we always hear sometimes about um, a whole bunch of pieces, like I said in the CBS video, that someone found like 40 pieces in someone's apartment. So it's still a possibility in my mind that it could be found somewhere. I know that there's been stories of people um, rebuilding old homes and removing a wall and surprise there's a famous Renoir behind the wall. So I mean, hopefully it will be found. And this piece is called the Just Judges, this panel. And every panel actually has its own title. And it was repainted from the Belgian art restorer Jeff on Dear Viking. And all of the pieces, all of these panels were heavily damaged during the war and during the um, transporting. Oil paint flakes when it becomes very dry. And so we see that a lot of the flakes were, um, pieces were falling off of the painting. So our restorer has really worked on this piece for a long time to make it okay to be shown. This piece is the Brugis Madonna, and we can see the Monuments Men finding it. And I wanted to read actually a couple passages from the Monuments Men about their discovery of this book. I feel like they're, they really paint a great picture of it. So this is Michelangelo's, um, one of his most known pieces, the Madonna. And we see that the Christ child is not cradled in his mother's arms, but standing within the folds of her gown, still protected by her. And you were to know immediately that you were in the presence of greatness. By the 1600s, Michelangelo evaluated to exalted status 
and the Belgians had come to regard the statue as a national treasure, and a century later the French had begun to covet its glory. And we see it really is a beautiful piece. And it's very different from early representations of the Madonna and the child. So here's some very traditional art pieces of the Madonna and child. We can see that Christ is usually held very close to her um, in an embrace in her arms. There is usually eye contact somewhere with the child. Um, the mother gazing down. We can see in the lower right that the child is gazing up to the mother. So now we can see how Michelangelo's depiction is very different. Um, Christ is standing on the ground. We feel that he is actually stepping away from his mother. And she is just very carefully observing him. She's probably going to let him go off and play. And this sculpture is actually carved out of marble, and I always think that's fascinating in art. Um, I think of a big giant block of marble that someone just finds and says, hey, I'm going to carve out of this a Madonna and a child. And he is able to carve the drapery very well, very flowing, and very folded, and we can see where her knees are, we can see where her arm is bent, and where she is seated. And so when the Monuments Men found her, they state, she was lying on her side on a filthy brown and white striped mattress, almost the very same mattress onto which she had been pushed just days before the British Monuments Man, Ronald Balfour, had arrived in Bruges eight months earlier. The light of our lamps played over the soft folds of the Madonna's robe, the delicate molding of her face, her grave eyes looked down, seemed only half aware of the sturdy child nestling close to her, one hand firmly held in hers. And so this piece actually was also not just stolen by the Nazis, but also stolen by the French in the late 18th century. So this piece was stolen more than once as well. Um, and then when, so when they took her out of the, took her out of the mine, they also state, he had spent several days wrapping the Bruges Madonna with coats, paper, and rope until it looked, in the words of Stout's assistant, like a trust ham. <laughs> a one-ton trust ham that is on which even a tiny scratch would be forever noticed by the world. But Stout was confident. Using a specially devised rope and pulley system, he carefully lifted the statue onto a waiting mine dog, declaring, I think we could bounce her from Alp to Alp all the way to Munich without doing her any harm. And then he proceeds to personally walk the mine dog and statue through the mine entrance. And he's right. Um, with marble, if one little scratch would seem to be out of place, I'm sure that everyone would notice. So today, the piece can be viewed in the Church of Our Lady in Bruges, Belgium, but it only can be viewed behind bulletproof glass. And you are, the closest you can get is about 15 feet away from the piece. So that's pretty interesting. So those are the two pieces that I really wanted to touch more about. Um, they're very important pieces in our history. And I also thought it was interesting as I researched them more that they both were stolen by other countries as well. But now they are both in their rightful homes for the public to view them as they should be. So this it concludes my presentation. Um, I would love any questions. I have, I think I have a couple minutes for questions um, and I will do my best to answer them. Yes. Um, talked about, um, I think that's Edinger, brought um, several of the monuments to New Jersey. 
Yes. Is there a museum in New Jersey that has these now? Um, I don't know what museum has them. I want to say New York, but I'm not 100% positive about that. But um, I know that he probably gave them to like a museum for public viewing. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. Was this um, the search? It sounds like it was initiated by FDR. Were there other players that wanted this to happen? Yes. Um, a lot of the directors of the museums that were overseas were already continuing to start their own their own plans to save the art. So we, the French director was um, one of the main ones that we learned about. Um, his um, his name was. Um, Jack Wassis, I believe. And so he was a big player, and they actually started before our Monuments Men went overseas. So it was kind of nice because there was already things being done that helped them greatly. Because with that few of men and that much territory, you're very outnumbered. Any other questions? Did you say there was one woman in the group? Rose. And she was the one who, yep, she was the one who spied. And then um, in 2007, when they recognized the men, there was also another woman that was pulled um, forward to be recognized for her um, for her contributions to it. And I believe she was the, one of the transcribers of all the communication back and forth. So she was the one who charted all the communications. I don't remember her name, but I remember her saying that. Um, she didn't even realize the importance of the conversations that she was keeping track of until the men were recognized in 2007. And so there's lots of stuff if um, you like to Google and you like YouTube and watching videos, there are very many videos that you can watch on the Monuments Men. You can spend a whole day just learning more about it. The History Channel has done quite a few really great documentaries. Yep. Was Rose a civilian or was she in the military? Um, she worked at the museum. She, I believe, so she, I believe she worked at the museum. So she was a civilian um, that decided she was going to spy. I, um, I didn't do a lot of research on her, but I believe a civilian. Yes? I just want to kind of tie two movies together. So this one is wonderful, but then also The Woman in Gold. Mm -hmm. and yes. 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 If you read the book to that, what you'll learn is that a lot of those who did not survive because of they weren't able to get there, they, they, were, they were part of the burn. They were part of the burn, yeah. So there's, there's pictures of what he did, but there's not, the works are gone. Yep. And, and it's tragic. For those who don't know, Gustav Klimt is a famous Jewish painter. Um, he was very mosaic with his painting style, so a lot of his women were painted in gold clothing with lots of squares of beautiful colors down, and they were much more flat, and he was much more flat with his style of painting. Um, that story is very fascinating because his pieces, when they were taken to the museums, and the if I'm getting this correct, the family stepped forward and they said, these are property of my family, that's my aunt that's being painted, and it went to court. And it was a, um, luckily the family did get the piece back, though. So. But that, the woman in gold is a very good. And the name has also changed. The Nazis changed the name yes. of the speech. Was the, uh, the, was the, the aunt's name that was the original title of the painting, and they wanted to take away her identity, so they could yeah, they wanted, the Germans wanted anything that was historically related to the Jews to be um, wiped away from our history. Cool. Well, thank you very much for listening.